Amen. I sure do appreciate the songs today and uh, it really is amazing and uh, it goes really right along with the uh, message today as well. So I, I always love that. So when we were singing, uh, uh, Jesus is coming, coming again, I'm going, yes, he is. And I'm about to preach on that. But uh, I just enjoy that. And I don't know if my wife is, uh, do you do the song? Do you pick out the songs? Okay. I don't know, we're in tune or something. Either that or she's looking on my computer and reading my message before I ever get a chance to preach it. One or the other, something's happening there. But uh, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> when she writes the message, she can do the songs really well. So that works out fine. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, listen, I want to tell you to please uh, pray for someone today. We have uh, Opal Cromer has been with our church many, many years. Uh, they found her on the bathroom floor this week with a uh, broken uh, ankle. And uh, there's a chance she could lose her foot. Uh, I think as the days go on, though, if she can get some healing going on, I think that she'll be okay. But it was a severe break and uh, at KU Medical Center and had to get her over there and get some plates in her uh, ankle, but uh, be, be in prayer for her. The can, really the concerning thing on the whole deal was that she uh, probably spent 24 hours uh, in that position. And, uh, but uh, you know, God did something amazing for her in that, uh, you know, Stanley, her son found out about that. And uh, so he comes over, finds out that she was probably there for uh, about 24 hours with a broken ankle, almost the bone, almost going through the skin. Just, I don't want to gross anybody out, but just to let you know how severe it was, uh, broken in numerous places. And um, she was there for a long time. You know, adrenaline kicks in initially and you don't feel anything, but then when that wears off, uh, you feel it tremendously. And, um, but uh, he came in uh, to see his mother and she's like, hi, Stan, how you doing? You know, and she just, he could not believe that. Uh, she goes, aren't you, he said, aren't you in pain? And he, she says, it's, it doesn't feel good, but uh, it's not too bad. And uh, he said, when they got to the hospital, the emergency ward, the doctors are going, how much pain are you in? She goes, maybe a five, you know, and uh, they're going, whoa. And nurses kept coming in and looking at her and, and she's just like doing fine. And uh, so it just amazes me that she didn't suffer too much um, when she was in that situation. But pray for Opal. Uh, she needs healing at this time. So uh, very good. We had a really wonderful day yesterday uh, with Baker University. And I don't know if any of the kids came or not, but... Uh, I really appreciate all those who participated in uh, uh, Baker has a meet and greet uh, for all the new kids and uh, we had a table set up and they did a little basketball thing and free candy bars and and uh, that kind of thing if they can get three in a row and uh, so uh, anyway it was a really good day and I appreciate all those who went out and uh, tried to be a good testimony for our church we got about 45 names that uh, we can send them a thank you for participating uh, in our little thing and invite them uh, to come to church. We would love to have a, a larger impact uh, with the kids at, uh, at Baker University. So very thankful for a good day yesterday. And uh, then also uh, just want to say thank you all for allowing us to be able to go on vacation. We are looking forward to it today. I apologize all you life groupers. I usually try to have a paper ready for you, but I'm, I'm like half on vacation already and I didn't get it done. You know, I'm saying, sorry, man. I'm, uh, I got other things on my mind and <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, anyway, it was uh, very good. Thank you all very much for that. And uh, I hope you pray for us that uh, the Lord gives safety and, uh, going to go see a grandbaby I haven't ever seen before. And, uh, got another one I've only seen once and he's about three years old and then, uh, got another one we've seen a couple of times, but, uh, anyway, hopefully going to have a good time and, uh, Pray for us. We uh, are April and Daniel were not able to go, but we are taking two of their children uh, who will be residing with us in our small tent. And uh, so um, hopefully that'll go well as well. But uh, we want all the grandkids to get together, you know, and be able to meet each other. They're all about the same age. And so we're hoping to have a good time and uh, appreciate uh, being able to use the trailer. Uh, and uh, Denise has got that thing packed. Uh, it's about this high and it's got about that much. It's got enough room for a cat to put up in there. And uh, other than that, it's got uh, sand toys and all kinds of bikes and everything else for every grandkid that uh, needs something to do. 
uh, got it all packed up and ready to go. So anyway, hope that we'll have a good time. All right, turning your Bibles, if you would, please, to um, over to uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. Appreciate Dan reading some of the, uh, the text uh, this morning. And uh, <clears throat> we are learning a little bit about Hebrews. I haven't really talked about who wrote Hebrews because I'm not 100% sure. A lot of, most people think that the Apostle Paul wrote it, and uh, there are some that uh, vociferously believe that he did not write it. So they, they think uh, possibly Timothy wrote it, and if not Timothy, then uh, uh, Apollos possibly. There's a couple of different. Uh, it sure looks like a Pauline epistle to me, but... Most of the time, Paul talks about the fact he says his name somewhere in a Pauline epistle, uh, and it doesn't happen in the book of Hebrews. No big deal. It uh, is truly a beautiful book, and uh, it begins by, if you think of the book of Hebrews, I want you to know it's uh, uh, elevating and accentuating the name of Jesus Christ, which is the, the one that we worship and adore. Uh, he is our hope and our salvation. And uh, that's really what the first part of Hebrews is really all about. And uh, so we uh, have begun learning a few things uh, from the uh, book of Hebrews. We learn that uh, initially, as we look at the office of what Jesus does, it uh, changes from Old Testament to New Testament in the fact that God used to speak to us through his prophets. And now Jesus takes that, that spot. Okay, so last week we, we talked about the fact that God... Uh, has uh, repeatedly spoken to mankind through, and verse 1 says, at sundry times and divers manners, he spoke to the prophets via the prophets. Uh, so <clears throat> he spoke to mankind through the prophets. And uh, so uh, we find that uh, that's how he passed it on. What was one of the messages that was uh, related to man through the prophets. Well, one of the main messages that is repeated over and over and over again is that Jesus Christ is coming. He didn't name him Jesus Christ, but he said Emmanuel, or uh, he, he spoke of the Messiah as coming and uh, made it very clear through many of the prophets. One of the main messages to mankind is that Christ was coming, a Messiah, Emmanuel, a Savior, a supreme sacrifice, etc., and so uh, from the very beginning, God said, uh, I am sending somebody and uh, he is going to, uh, there are veiled references of uh, the coming Christ. Many times some of the references aren't really clear. It wasn't clear to Old Testament people who they were speaking of. But when you get to the New Testament and see what was written, it becomes very clear that he's referring to Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's uh, very interesting when he talks about the works of Christ and what he would do in the Old Testament. Uh, it's interesting how that he mentions being pierced in the hands and the feet. We mentioned some of these things last week. Mentions his crucifixion. By the way, and I've said this before, but crucifixion wasn't even invented when the prophet mentioned piercing his hands and his feet. The Romans invented the uh, crucifixion and uh, it hadn't even been invented yet. Uh, uh, when uh, the prophet was, uh, was uh, talking about that. But uh, crucifixion was mentioned. His leadership role uh, was mentioned. His salvation. The, the mystery of the gospel was revealed. They didn't understand that this Messiah would come. They thought he would come as a warrior that would fight the ruling powers that were suppressing uh, all of Judea and all of Jerusalem and all of Israel. And uh, he thought that they would come as a mighty warrior that would free them. And he would free them, but he would free them from sin. And they, they didn't think that he would ever die. Even Peter, who spent three and a half years with Christ, when Christ said, I'm about to die, he takes him by the lapels and he says, no, you're not. That's not, what, that's not the narrative that I'm ready for. I'm ready for you to be king and I'm going to be your right-hand man. And uh, that's what they wanted. And uh, that's what uh, uh, James and John's mother said, too. You know, when the kingdom starts, you know, it's, everything's about ready to get kicked off here. Uh, could uh, my sons be on your right and your left-hand side, you know? And so um, that's what they wanted. So uh, there was a little bit of a mystery, especially when the, they were in the Old Testament. And they looked at these things. They didn't understand it until it became very clear after Christ uh, did what he did, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and after the ascension it all became clear what the plan was so God's spoken to mankind mainly about the message of a coming Christ and his current message to us 
uh, today is spoken through his son. So now we read the red letters, the red letter part of our Bibles, and we realize this is the son of God speaking to mankind, and that is the plan of God, is that now I'm going to speak to him through his son. And that's what we learned last week. Verse number two, God hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the, uh, the worlds. And so, so therefore, it's no wonder that Jesus is, uh, has such a prominent role in the church today. That's why we lift him up. There's hopefully, there's never a Sunday that goes by that we don't mention sometime the name of Christ. There are some churches you go to, they never mention the name of Christ. They'll mention being generous. They'll mention how, how it's good to be nice to people. And uh, they'll mention all these other things, but they'll never mention the name of Christ and what he did for us. And we try not to let a week go by that we don't somehow make some reference to Christ and the blood that he shed on the cross and, and uh, the resurrection and the power of Jesus Christ because he, makes, uh, he is so uh, important to us. It's interesting that we live in a time and a day that 2,000 years after uh, this individual in history died on a cross, was buried, and rose again. We believe he rose again. Uh, many believe that he, he was not risen again. And yet we find that all over this country, yea, all over the world, that on uh, this day we come to a house, we come together, we sing songs about this one that died was buried 2,000 years ago. Uh, there are people who are today dying for the cause of Christ. If they would just repent and become Muslim in some countries, uh, they give them a chance. They say, you better, you better become Muslim or you will die. There are many that die for the cause of Christ. There are some in some countries, such as in Iran, uh, there are Christians that are being persecuted and imprisoned today simply because they are a Christian. And yet we find that this individual is really the most influential man in all of history. From the, time, uh, from the beginning of time, you take the uh, totality of all of mankind and you add it up, there is one individual that far and away is more influential than any other man that's ever walked the face of this earth, and that is the one that we serve. That is Jesus Christ. No other one. Time Magazine writes of the 10 most influential men in all of history, and Jesus Christ is number one. That's the same way with many other surveys and statistics uh, and uh, whatever you call those things where they get people's opinion. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Jesus Christ is over and over again the number one uh, figure. And it uh, is uh, not surprising because of the fact that uh, many in this world are willing to die for the cause of Christ. Many in this world are willing to be uh, persecuted. Many in this world are imprisoned today because they trust in Jesus Christ. How can he not be the most influential man in the world? Uh, the only ones that I found that disagreed with those surveys was uh, like MIT, a bunch of brainiacs, you know. Uh, they think that they put Jesus as number two, Aristotle being the number one influencer of the world. I say to them, who's in prison today because of Aristotle? Nobody. Who is dying for the cause of Aristotle? Nobody. Uh, I, I'd say they're crazy for thinking that. And so um, we believe that uh, one of the reasons why Jesus is the most influential one in the world is because he truly is the son of God. And we have faith that he is that. He is the greatest. And I know we hate superlatives. We hate to say, oh, I'm the greatest and all that kind of stuff. I, I uh, recoil when I see a uh, film of Muhammad Ali saying how great he was. And um, I wish in my heart that he would get beat, you know. He was a great boxer. He truly was. And uh, I don't dislike him uh, for any other reason than I don't like people saying they're the greatest at anything. I don't like those uh, kind of superlatives. It comes off as being exaggerated bravado when others talk about being the, the greatest. It comes off as sounding braggadocious. Um, these statements seem to be unwise. People that say those kind of things, you cringe when you hear uh, people say that thing. It is, that, it is certainly true in every case except in the case of Jesus Christ. Because he is the greatest in the world. And um, it, uh, he truly is. And so uh, when Jesus speaks of himself and he can say it. He can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And it is nothing but truth. 
We find in verse number two, Jesus is the greatest because he speaks for God now. He is God's mouthpiece. Uh, he represents God. Look at verse number three in our text, Hebrews chapter one. Who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. You look at him, you're looking at the Father. He is the image of God himself, upholding all things by uh, the word of his power. He is that powerful. He, uh, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty, uh, majesty on high. So Jesus can say it like it is, and uh, it's not bragging when he says it. It's just like the, uh, the grandfather who's bragging on his grandson. He says, it's not bragging if it's true. And uh, certainly is true with Jesus. Uh, he's not bragging. It's true. He is the greatest of all time. My Bible says in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we, may, we must be saved, other than the name of Jesus Christ. He's the only way. There's no other way of salvation. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John 3, 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath life. He that believeth not hath not life. Uh, and shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him, because you don't have the greatest inside of you, and that is Jesus Christ. First Timothy 2, 5, there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. First, uh, First John 5, 11, and this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his great Son, Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Couldn't be any clearer in our scriptures who the greatest is. And uh, it's nothing but fact. And so this is why we talk so much about him. This is why we elevate him is because he is so good. And that's what the writer of Hebrews did in chapter 1. He begins with verse 1, 2, and 3 talking about how much God speaks through him now. But then in verse 4, all the way down, it's just nothing but worship and glory uh, to the Heavenly Father. Uh, he is better than any. He's better than anyone supernaturally. Uh, all the, back in Bible times, the early church, if you will, they had a little bit of a problem that uh, they would worship angels sometimes too because they were supernatural beings that would appear occasionally as well, and they would have a tendency to worship them too. And the writer of Hebrews wants to say, hey, Jesus is above everyone, above everyone supernaturally. So if you see an angel and you see Christ, you bow before Christ, not before an angel. And so uh, he is uh, better than anyone supernaturally. Look at verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, right? as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. There's no competition, not even supernaturally. Uh, angels are actually supposed to worship Christ, verse 6 of our text. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. And the angels began singing and worshiping the Christ child, if you remember the Christmas story. And that's what angels were supposed to do. Angels have, they don't hold a candle to Jesus Christ. He's the greatest. He's better than any relationally as well. And here's the reason why. Because he's the son of God. Uh, verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son? None. That's a rhetorical question really, isn't it? Which of the angels said, Thou art my son? None. Jesus is the son He's the only begotten Son of God. So he's better than any relationally as he was born the Son of God. He's better than any royally as well. Speaks of a king and his throne. Hey, there's only one king. There's only one that sits upon the throne for all of eternity. And that is Jesus Christ. Look at our text, verse number 8. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Yours is going to last forever and ever. You are the, you're going to rule and you're going to reign like no one ever before. No competition whatsoever. He is the greatest positionally as well. Verse number 9. Thou hast loved righteousness, hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. 
the position of God, uh, Christ, is above anyone else. And so um, he sits at the right hand of the Father as well positionally. Verse 13, which of the angels, again rhetorical, which of the angels said he at any time sit on my right hand? None. They were all worshiping before and serving uh, the Father. Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. Verse number 13, sit on my right hand. Who else said that? Who, who else was told that? None. And then uh, finally, he's better uh, uh, experientially as well. He's the one who created the world. Verse number 10, uh, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. Who else has done anything like that? Created the world and the universe and everything that's ever everything that we can see. Christ is the one who created it. Who has done anything more than that? No one. He has no competitor. And so how crazy would it be to ignore the name of Christ? To not put him up on the shelf, to not put him up on the, on the pedestal and to worship him and to mention him. It would be crazy not to. And so at our church, I hope that we always lift up the name of Christ and, uh, and magnify his glorious name because of who he is, what he's done, and what he means uh, to us. But I will say that there are times uh, that as we live our life, I know that there's times we get tired. I know there's times we get discouraged. I know there are times we say, Lord, where are you? Where are you? I need your help. So there are times, sometimes, where we get weary in this life, and sometimes we suffer, and we wonder, where is this Christ that we lift up? The Savior of the world. How come you're not helping me right now? Sometimes we wonder when we are in need and we have uh, problems, financial, marital, health. Sometimes when we pray a prayer, our prayer is denied. And the answer is no, I'm not going to relieve you from this. You will go through this. And we try to teach here that sometimes when he allows us to go through problems, by being a Christian is not a default the answer is, hey, I, I've got, I'm on easy street the rest of my life. That is not true. But we do say, and we do preach, and we do teach, not a health and wealth gospel, but we do preach that he will be with us through it. He will help us through that. And how many of us have gone through heartache and turmoil and storms in our life, and we've had the Lord Jesus Christ walk through those issues with us? And as with that beautiful poem, if you've never read the poem of the footprints in the sand, uh, we say, where are you, Lord? And we look back and because we're all by ourselves, and those aren't uh, your footprints. Those are Christ as he's carrying us through the storm. Beautiful poem that we sang a song today that had mentioned the footprints as well. I thought that was neat. And so um, some will say, uh, when are you coming back? You said you were coming back. We keep hearing about this in generation after generation. You're coming back. You're coming back. When is it coming back? It's been a couple thousand years. Can I close with a passage of Scripture this morning? It's just a little bit to the right of Hebrews, and it's Second Peter. And I, want, I, want to, I want to give you a really good passage to encourage us in Christ and, and uh, some thoughts along these lines. So some might say, well, if Jesus is such a great Savior, then why hasn't he come back yet? Here's, here's the reason why Peter announces this way back then. It's because he's on a different time clock than we are. 2,000 years for him is not very long at all, okay? And that's why we like 2 Peter, because it explains these things, okay? 2 Peter uh, says, you know what? In verse number three, it says, in the last days, there will, there's going to be scoffers that come. And they're going to say, well, where's he at? Why isn't he coming? If he's so great, why hasn't he come yet? Well, it's interesting because 2,000 years ago, a man sat down and he wrote. And he says, there's coming a day where there's scoffers that are going to come. And they're going to say, why haven't you come yet? And let me explain why that is. Thankfully, he wrote this. Uh, by, the, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote this. Uh, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, 
all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. It just seems like we wake up every day, every month, every year, every decade, every century, every millennia, and uh, it's still the same. Where's he at? Here's where he is. We have to realize he's on a different time clock than we are. Look at verse number eight. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And as a thousand years is as a day. So in God's time clock, what's happened is, is two days have passed. <laughs> the equivalent of two days. It's nothing. He could wait another week in uh, thousands of years. He could wait as long as he wants to. He'll come when he's good and ready to come. Some might say uh, one of the reasons for his delay is found in verse number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He's not up there going, oh man, I was supposed to come back years ago. Not at all. He's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But here's what it is. But he is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. The only reason he's not come is because he says, it's time for, I want that guy to repent. And I want him to get saved. And I want her to find out about uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want them to get saved. And so I'm going to hold it off for a while. Part of the reason why it's been 2,000 years is because he's waiting Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. This is the desire of God. And I'm not going to come yet because of long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, the Bible says in verse number 10. Here's what you can take to the bank. It will come, and it will come as a thief in the night. It'll come in a moment that you had no idea that it was about to come, and boom, it'll happen. The Bible says it comes in a twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, all of a sudden it'll happen. No one will be ready for it. No one will be uh, going, oh, it's about to come. So every time you hear on the news that so-and-so says that the coming is going to come on this day, uh, you can guarantee it's not going to come on that day. I'm going to wake up and I'll go, well, one thing I know, the rapture ain't going to happen today. The Lord's not coming today. Isn't that interesting? And so uh, we find that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, God is on a different time frame than we are. And so, um, it, but he, here's the point that he uh, eventually comes down to, and that is this, is that if you have found Jesus and you understand his greatness, and you've accepted him as personal Lord and Savior. You've prayed, Lord, I can't save myself. I can't get to heaven on my own. Would you save my soul? Would you come in and be the Lord of my life? Would you forgive me of all my sins? You're the forgiver. You're the saver. Would you save me? Would you forgive me of my sins? Once you found Christ, from that moment on, live the rest of your life for him. That's the point of 2 Peter 3. From that moment on, if you're going to be found, if all of a sudden one day Christ comes, I want him to come finding me living for him. I want him to come finding I'm busy for him. I'm a testimony for him. I'm faithful to him. That's how I want him to find me. And that's what uh, Peter says. Even though it's been a long time, even though there's scoffers that say, hey, where's he at? He said, be, be diligent. If you found the Christ, uh, look for his coming. Look what it says in verse number 11. He said, hey, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, that his coming will come, um, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Conversation typically means behavior. We think of it as our talking, and it includes how you talk. He says, so, he says, because he's coming, be holy in your conversation. Be holy and godly in your life. Live for him. Be consistent. Oh, by the way, if you're going to be caught, if he's going to actually come and catch you, here's what you need to be. Verse 12, be looking for his coming. Be looking for and hasting to unto the coming of the Lord. We should every day expect that this could it be, that this could be the day that starts our eternity. This could be the day that he comes uh, and uh, receives us up into his heaven. So if I were to be doing what he wants me to do, if you found Christ, be holy in your behavior, be constantly looking for his coming, 
Verse 14 says that we should be, you should look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace without spot, blameless. I should have my sins confessed and I should be ready to go. If I'm going on vacation, heaven, I'm not talking about Michigan. I'm not there. I'm talking about heaven. Um, if I'm going, I better be packed. I better be ready to go, man. And so we should be looking for his coming and we should be ready. That means that I don't have spot or blemish or hatred or jealousy or unconfessed sins. I should get those things cleaned up every day so that I can say, you know what? If the coming is today, my bags are packed. I'm ready to go. I'm right with him and I cannot wait to, uh, to rise up with him. How wonderful that would be. We should just be excited about that. And when I was a kid, I used to have a youth director that uh, sometimes he would get up and give announcements and he was crazy. And he would say, hey, guys, let's do this. We're always supposed to be looking for the coming of Christ, right? Uh, so let's do this. Everybody stand. And he'd have everybody stand. He said, let's do a rapture uh, practice drill, okay? We do drills for practice. And, he'd, da, 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 and he, was, he did this little jump thing, you know, just ready to go. He was crazy. But that's how we should be. We should be looking for the coming of Christ. Bags packed, ready to go. Our conversation, behavior, uh, right and uh, we should be right where, where God wants us to be. And so that's what the uh, Lord wants us to be. He wants us to be diligent, that we may be found of Jesus doing good. Verse 14. Verse 17 says that we should beware of getting off track. Well, what's it say in verse 17? Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things, you know Christ, you know that you're supposed to be ready, you know you're supposed to have your bags packed and ready to go for the coming of Christ. Don't harbor those things. Get rid of them. If you sin, if you get off the path, confess those things so that you're ready just in case today is that day. Seeing then that you know these things, verse 17, beware lest ye also being led away captive, led away with error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Beware of that. Stay on track. Uh, be, and then finally, verse number 18, we should be growing. If I were to add them all up, verse 11, be holy. Uh, verse 12, be looking for his coming. Verse 14, be diligent. Verse 17, beware, lest anyone get you off track. And then verse 18 is be growing in Christ. Are you growing in Christ? I mean, if he were to come today, I want him to see that I'm growing in him, learning. I pray. I read my Bible. I, I go to church. Sometimes I take notes and I meditate on the things that I learn each and every week. And it's important to me. And so that's what God wants us to do as well. He wants us to be growing. Until he comes, we need to be faithful and growing in him. Amen? You know, I uh, appreciate a, uh, a, an article that I read some time ago by uh, Keith Basham. He's a guy that is an, uh, was an editor for the Baptist Bible Tribune. And uh, he taught me something that I did not know about um, the, uh, the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Now, this is a guy that lived uh, and he wrote a famous um, Christmas carol. And it, I think it's probably one of those things that you don't really pay attention to the words so much. But uh, he uh, highlighted them for me and I, I learned a little something. I did not know that in 1863, 100 years before I was born, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a famous poet, had actually come to the lowest part of his life. And uh, his first wife uh, had, uh, had been uh, gone for a long time. His second wife had been dead for about a year or two. She actually tragically passed away in a fire at their home. And uh, adding to his heartache, his son, Charles, had uh, just uh, signed up for the Union Army against his dad's wishes. He said, don't uh, join. But uh, against his wishes, he joined his father in the Union Army. And uh, during one of the battles, his father had just found out that his son had been critically wounded. And, um, and so Longfellow, his life was kind of falling apart. Everyone around him that uh, his loved ones uh, were uh, leaving. And uh, this uh, once vivacious poet had actually not written anything in years. And one night, Christmas time was coming. And uh, as he was uh, upon his bed, he heard the bells begin to ring. And uh, 
in his poetic style, he began, ring, uh, uh, he began writing because he was not in the mood for celebration. He was in despair. And that's why he writes the words of the Christmas song written 150 years ago. He says, and in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. The poem eventually, the next verse, he eventually becomes a, a Christmas carol, which uh, strikes all of us somewhat odd that something so negative of bowing his head in despair, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong. You think of the Union and Confederate armies and the, the casualties that were happening the, and the slaughter. It says, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And so uh, the reality of life includes uh, cannons and thunderings and earthquakes tearing the land apart, leading the poet to conclude, and in despair I bowed my head. But as is the case with so many of the Psalms, if you read many of the Davidic Psalms, many of them start off in the exact same manner of despair. Where are you, God? Why haven't you come? And so, as is the case with many of the Psalms, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow came to the same conclusion. Mr. Longfellow comes to the same conclusion as David, and he ends up saying, God is still there, and he will have the last say at the end. Then peel the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail. The wrong shall fail, the right shall prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. I know sometimes our lives, it can get long and, and tiring, and, and sometimes we don't get our way in everything, and sometimes the path we lead is actually very difficult. But the truth of the matter is, is Christ will help you through each and every step. If you don't believe me, you, uh, all you have to do is talk to a number of the people that are here today, where God has helped them through some of the most difficult parts of their life. And today they have peace and they have joy in their heart, even as they went through that. And I could tell some stories today, I'm telling you, um, of some people. I don't know how you get up in the morning. I don't know how you smile after knowing what you've gone through. And yet you do. And the reason is because the grace of God comes down upon you and he continues to give us hope. And we continue to believe that Christ is coming again that either through the rapture or through my own death, that I will see the Lord. And I believe that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. After that, I get to see him. And uh, I believe that it, he will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into thy rest. I believe that, that uh, Christ does love us. I do believe that he is preparing a place for me. And if he's preparing a place for me, that he will doubtless come again and receive me unto, my, unto himself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He wants me to be with him. And that one day, as Revelation says, every tear will be wiped from our faces. Yes, he, he knows that hard days will come, and he knows that we have difficult things, but one day he will wipe the tears from our eyes. Revelation speaks of that. And what a day that will be. So if you found Christ, the one that we lift up, don't get weary in well-doing. Continue on. Be strong. Lean on him when you need to. Receive comfort from him when you need to. But always be faithful to him and be ready. If today is the day that he's coming, uh, be ready for him to come and receive you. Have your bags packed. Don't have spot. Don't have sin. Let go of that stuff. Confess it every day and be ready for the coming of Jesus Christ because he is the greatest. And his throne will last forever. Amen? Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. And I thank you, Lord, for reminding us of, of the Christ that we serve. Father, your, your son has given everything for us. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. Father, if there's be one person here today that doesn't know you as personal Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them to realize they need to have a moment with you where they express... It's good to express their faith and their trust and belief that you are the only way. And I pray that they would come to you and express that they need you for salvation. 
And I pray, Lord, that they would give their heart and their life to you, Father. I pray, Lord, that they would give their sin to you as well and ask you for forgiveness. Father, I, if there's someone here today that doesn't have a distinct memory of a moment like that, I pray that they would have their moment. And I pray, Lord, that they place their faith and trust in the number one most influential man in the world, and that is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Father, if there's some here today that maybe they have accepted you, but some are weary and well-doing. Maybe they've had a difficult week this week or going through a particular trial. Oh, Father in heaven, I pray that they would lean upon Jesus Christ, and I pray, Lord, that you would give them the grace that they need to go through that and realize, Father, that you're always there. You'll never leave them nor forsake them and that you will give grace and strength in our time of need. I pray, Lord, that we would encourage ourselves with these words of who you are. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Oh, I love the song, 638. And um, it's, uh, I need thee every hour. This is my favorite song. I have days where I sing this all day long to the Lord. Do you know it today? This is a prayer. You sing this to the Lord. Would you sing this to the Lord today? I need thee every hour. Dan, would you lead us today? I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, grant me now, thy Savior, I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptation lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. On the last thank you, Lord, so much for the promises of your word. And I thank you, Lord, that uh, we can come to you. Your word says that we can come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. And I'm so thankful, Lord, your open door policy. And so, Father in heaven, I just want to pray, Lord, for these folks that are here. If there's someone here that uh, would like to know more about being saved uh, or receiving Jesus Christ and believing in him, I pray, Lord, that you would help them to realize that uh, I want to talk to them. And I pray, Lord, that they would get saved. And I pray, Lord, that if someone does uh, receive you as Lord and Savior of their life, I pray that they would tell me about it, too. I want to be encouraged by uh, their faith and their uh, big decision, their moment with you. I pray that people would talk about it and say, I've had a moment with the Lord and and I've asked him to be my Lord and Savior. And I pray, Lord, that we'd be able to share that with one another. Because uh, it's such a momentous moment in our life. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to realize that. So thank you, Lord, for that. But uh, I pray, Lord, that you'd encourage us, your children. And to help us, Lord, to be encouraged that as we serve and trust a Savior, you are the greatest in the world. And we thank you, Lord, for that. Pray, Lord, that we'd be faithful to you. Pray, Lord, we'd not be weary and well-doing. But I pray, Father, we'd receive your grace and strength to go through each and every moment in our life. And, Father, if today is the day, we will rejoice and be glad in that, certainly. We look forward to seeing you face to face, Father. And I pray, Lord, you help us be faithful till that day. 
I pray, Lord, you bless this church tonight, that you would just give them a, a wonderful, safe day. Until we meet again, Lord, we pray for your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Love you all. God bless you. You are dismissed. Amen.